Um, this is like deja vu all over again, morning session with a four-letter acronym in FileMaker. So this is a session on super fast reporting with Perform Script on Server, or PSOS. Um, I've never heard it called PSOS, but uh, it's just usually PSOS, and then Virtualist. Um, and can you hear me? Louder. Louder. Is that better? OK, I'll try to speak a little bit louder, too. All right, so um, super fast reporting with PSOS and virtual list, um, and a little bit of SQL. It's not required, but we're going to do just a little bit in there. It works well with virtual list. Uh, so we'll do a short intro to that. The title is already long, so I just squeeze it in at the last minute. Um, who am I? My name is Anders Monson. I'm a developer and a trainer occasionally with Solion Consulting. Uh, like the title says, we're a consulting firm. I do FileMaker, Web, Salesforce. Uh, I uh, got a few certifications along the way, spoken at DEF CON a few times, uh, and so I think this is my 11th session in the past 10 years. Working with FileMaker since, wow, 1994, and um, uh, written a few articles along the way. I wrote one on uh, virtual list a few years ago, so it's, uh, it's an area that I really like. And form script on server and virtual list, to me, they work very well together. Outside FileMaker, although, uh, to be honest, I, I, I track all my running in FileMaker. I track all my writing in FileMaker, but I don't, I don't track my martial arts stuff in FileMaker. So I can't escape it. Right? Um, and I'm a, like I said, I put there at the end, I'm an aspiring crime writer. I've done a few novels, but they're not yet published, so that's... That's my, my uh, way to do stuff that's outside FileMaker. Right. So we have a few goals today. Uh, we're not going to approach them sequentially, but I just put them up here. So what is virtual list? Some of you may be familiar with it, but we'll discuss that. And then uh, we'll see a little bit uh, of SQL in FileMaker. Uh, again, some of you are probably familiar with it. It's been around for a few years. If not, don't worry. We're not going to get too deep into SQL. That's a session unto itself. Then we'll look at some basics of Perform Script on Server, uh, some considerations to keep in mind when you're using PSOS. And it's gonna be hard for me to use uh, one consistently, the term that is, uh, because I use both. Uh, you know, it's hard to say one isn't faster than the other. And I'm gonna mash all these together, PSOS plus virtual list plus SQL, and we're gonna hope that we get up with some, get the, end up with some super fast reporting. I put an asterisk at the end there because um, and I'll introduce another four-letter acronym, your mileage may vary, right? So this is a technique and a concept, or multiple techniques and concepts. When it's applied to your solution, it's not gonna be exactly the same as, as another solution, but I think it's still faster. Uh, one of the reports that I wrote that inspired this, over the WAN, as a client, took almost 10 minutes to run. It's a fairly complex report. It's built up uh, uh, stuff over time. It's accrued requirements, and it probably needs to be rewritten re re at some point. But sit there for 10 minutes after you push a button waiting for a port, that's not very efficient. So one step, one script step change, and that one report took five seconds, which I think that's fast. I mean, it's not really, really fast. It could be faster. And probably over the LAN, locally there, when you're sitting, it's even faster than five seconds. But from 535 seconds to five seconds, that's fast. So again, we're mashing these together. We have a bunch of techniques, a bunch of concepts to think about. And when we have those, we have to ask ourselves, why, why even do this? There, there could be other ways to do it. Well, Perform Script on Server is, is great to offload some intensive tasks onto the server. It's not a cure-all. It doesn't solve everything. It shouldn't be used in every instance. There are rules and considerations, but it's really useful when you want to upload some heavy tasks such as um, finds, some SQL queries, uh, layout changes, looping, a bunch of other things that, that really take time, especially on big data sets. Then again, why virtual list, right? So we, can, we have reports in FileMaker, sub-summary report layouts that we can build, um, that works. Uh, for the most part, but it doesn't always work the way we want it when we're pulling data in from multiple sources, when we're doing some interesting things with um, uh, condition, conditional requirements on the type of data that we have. Uh, and uh, if we want to then sort of push that into another table instead and say, okay, we want to format that table in a certain way, 
Uh, now we're getting into the, the realm that it's not nearly multi-user safe if multiple people are in that same table doing, you know, adding records, deleting records, sorting stuff uh, in, in ways that they want and manipulating data. So um, also sub-summary reports, really we can't export those to Excel, for example. They don't, they don't export nicely um, because as we all know, one does not simply export sub-summary reports in FileMaker. Right? <laughs> It is, it is not done. So, sorry, my, my daughter's into memes, so I had to use that as a name there. Right, so. uh, why is SQL? Well, SQL is good because it's context-free. Uh, going back to perform script on server, uh, you, you need to know the context that you're in. You can't, you, you can't expect and assume that a perform script on server script will know exactly the context that you're going to be on. So. Um, if you use SQL, sometimes it's independent. You can just you know, query the data, and you don't have to be in a specific layout or specific layouts in terms of where you want to get that. Also, it returns delimited data, um, at least if you use the, the record separator uh, in the default uh, format. And virtual list requires delimited data. So it's like, wow, that works great together. So, um, all right, so the two-minute introduction to SQL in FileMaker came out in FileMaker 12, so it's a few versions ago, not too, uh, not too distant in the past, so we've, we've probably had some exposure to it. Basically, it's a method where we, we gather data, we say we want something from somewhere, and maybe with a certain criteria, right? So uh, find x from y where z. And the, 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 the function inside FileMaker is pretty simple. The execute SQL function has a query as the first parameter, uh, two other required parameters, which is the field separator, the default of which is a comma, and the record separator, the default which is a return. So if we leave that return in there, then we have our return to limited data. Right? And then we have optional parameters or arguments at the end that, that we won't get into uh, specifically now, but that can be very useful when you're tar targeting data that you're querying. Right? Um, also, I know some of you have probably used SQL, and SQL can be a little fragile in FileMaker if you change fields and stuff. So just for the sake of clarity, before you raise your hand and say, why are you doing it this way, I'm just hard coding all the SQL, uh, the, the few SQL examples that we have in here so we can just see stuff without any distractions with field names and fu custom functions and all that stuff. Right, so in this case here, um, our query is just select ID and first name and last name from the contacts table where the state is Texas. So it's pretty simple. Um, and you just have to turn up smart quotes to, to make it uh, clean sometimes if you're pasting in text. So when we're formatting SQL results in virtual list, we want to consider we have at the top, we have a result with comma. That's our default result. But our fields that we're pulling in for our report might have commas in there. Um, that, that wouldn't work because it would split out, um, out those fields. So uh, consider using something as unique that's, that, that you can have that you won't find in fields as separators. For simplicity's sake, I'm just showing two here, tilde and pipe. You can combine stuff. You can use like um, tilde and pipe together. You can use other symbols that might, show, might not show up. Some people have used UUIDs uh, and, and other uh, separators that you won't find in records, right? So for the virtual list purpose, we're going to keep the default return between the records. So the second result will just have the tildes in there. Sometimes they'll put pipes in there, but if I'm debugging stuff, the tildes are easier to see than the pipe symbols because they could, they could look identical to the, to the number one or to a letter, uh, capital letter I, for example. Uh, then we'll set that result eventually into a global variable. So uh, that, you know, with a query, is just going to drop that into a global variable. Variable. And it doesn't have to be that specific result at that time. You could gather data, you can manipulate that from the SQL and push that uh, into the global variable eventually. All right, so let me just do a quick demo in the SQL here so we can see how that works. All right, so I just have to switch between modes here. Try to make this a little bit bigger. All right, so at the top left, we have our simple query. Same thing, select ID, city, state. So we're just gathering fields from the table. In the middle, we have a field separator and record separator um, fields that we can input here. So we can just test our data, how it looks. And then uh, the sample data 
uh, that, we, uh, that we're using is the table name of contacts and has field names. So this is just visually so I can see what's going on here. If I go into my managed database, it's the same thing here. Here's a SQL table with my um, SQL query and then my contacts table uh, just for the demo purpose. All right. So if I have a field separate in here and I put, uh, if I just do the query right now, it just puts my data in with, uh, with commas. If I put a tilde in here, uh, it changes that to a tilde. So now I have a separator in here uh, and, and I can use this in any query that I want and combine it with the virtual list as we'll see uh, once we get into that part. Right, so again, just brief, brief uh, stuff on SQL. Uh, we'll see some more examples uh, that, that use a little bit SQL later on, but I just want to uh, explain why or how, that, how this concept works in terms of separators between fields and keeping the default row record separator in there. Also, I know that we need to keep hydrated when we're in the desert, we're speaking. I'm not sure which speaker brought this. <laughs> uh, it was here. It's not cold, and I don't have an opener. All right, so uh, virtual list table. First, uh, the first time I heard about it was about 2011 or so. Um, originator is Bruce Robertson. And essentially, it's a, it's a table in FileMaker that's formatted in a unique way. Right? So it's a, it's, a ut it's a utility table. And it's extensible in the sense of, of, of how many columns you want. So it's not, you don't have to, you're not limited to a certain number of columns in there. But the way this is defined, if you're new to the virtual list, essentially you have a serial field. And that is numbered from one to however many records you have in the table. You pre-populate that table with those records and all of them will have one through whatever number that is. So, and that number means those are the records that will come in there for your report or your data. And if you need more records because your report's longer, you just add those records. You make sure that you don't delete anything, you don't have any gaps in the serial numbers, and that sits there. Yes? Is there an advantage of that? Is there a value, uh, is there is an advantage of using value count in, in the serial number? You can, you can create the numbers you need if you want to create it on the fly. Is that what you mean? Yes. yes. So uh, the only advantage is that these records already exist, and creating records sometimes takes time. So if you, pre, if you have the records already in there, it saves you a little bit of time. So that's, if, I'm, if I'm looking for a fast report, I don't want to just create those records and wait for that to happen. But um, if you don't need, if you just need to create the reports, uh, create the records on the fly because you're not uh, you, don't, you, you can have the time for it, then that's fine. Just create those records. Just have a script that creates those records. When you're done, delete those records and then reuse that. So, but, um, it's not, it's not a hundred percent multi-user safe, but it's more multi-user safe than using a single table. So, um, it, if, if you, uh, well, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, that's a simplification, but it, it does work. Uh, I have a microphone here. If you have a question, just raise your hand. You have one? All right. So yeah, it's it's a simplification, but it, it's it's more multi-user safe than uh, creating creating a, a a specific table with specific records in there. Um, a global variable, uh, although you, I've seen people use global fields and, and other methods, but in terms of how I use it, a global variable then populates the data. Uh, if you store that, uh, in this case, I have a, a record, in, a, a field in here called row content, just so I can see everything. Um, but you could have it to where it populates each individual field from that global variable. And then the columns are, the, if you see it in the report, the columns are your uh, horizontal columns that will have the data for each of the records in, in that table. Uh, it's important to remember that those are uh, unstored calculation fields uh, for those columns. And then you just view this in a list view, and you can, you can, uh, you can format uh, the fields in there using conditional formatting uh, based on uh, certain uh, data that's in the fields. And you can also then save that to PDF or Excel as needed. All right. All right, so this is a simplified demo file here, just as a virtual list example. And um, all, all we have here is the same thing that you saw 
as a serial, serial number field, the field for the row content to store the, val the value of the global variable, and it has three columns in here. If I want to populate this data, I have a script just to fill, uh, fill this table in. And it would fill it in with some random words. So this is just a, 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 a randomizer. And I'm just going to say, let, let's put in, say, uh, 25 rows and two columns. If I create that, in the, the row content uh, field, it just has each of the random values separated by a pipe. And then using a substitute on the pipe to convert that into return delimited. Uh, and then uh, a get value, I can split that out into the columns here. All right. So same thing here. If I want to do five and three, it dynamically updates uh, as to how many, how many columns you want. So you can keep adding stuff to that as needed. So with SQL, um, if we have, if we, if, instead of just doing random data, if we have a context table and we want to query that, uh, we can use the same thing. So instead of having just, uh, just random Latin text, so five rows and three columns, I'll create that. And we'll get into the script in a second, but it puts the first name, last name, company into the first First, uh, the, very, the, uh, the row content data based on the global variable. A column one, um, because in the script here I have the header as well, puts the header uh, from, the, from the table, and then the next rows are the content. So you can have um, the same thing with, uh, say, 50 and two, uh, and create those records there. So uh, this is locally, this is not on the server yet, but this is just to show how we can create that. So if we look at the script, this is, uh, ignore this first part here. That's just a, a way that I can uh, randomly look at uh, how many columns I want to put, how many rows I want to have in there. Um, and also this here, this SQL looks at the built-in FileMaker tables to just grab the field names so that I can random, uh, so I can assign them to the columns as I want in here. In a real query, you'd, you wouldn't use necessarily this part. You'd specifically say, I want these these specific columns. And then down here, the SQL looks at um, select the, uh, the actual fields that I want, the first two fields, the first three fields, et cetera, uh, based on the table. And then I use fetch first so I can limit it based on the number of rows. So it's just, a, again, just a way to get, uh, you can look at these files when they're up there, but this is, this, is a, uh, this is a hypothetical thing, so you can see just demo data in here. Uh, so with SQL, again, uh, all you have to do is use the return delimited uh, default separator, and everything is, is handled uh, uh, for the, the virtual list in there. All right. All right, so what's perform script and server? It's a script step. That's it. Session's over. That's all you need to know. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, uh, it's, a, it, it's been around since FileMaker 13, uh, so year after uh, SQL. And um, nothing's really changed with it in the past four years. It's still the same script step, right? So it has two actions in there. You can uh, have it asked to you know, wait for completion or run and then keep doing stuff. So in this case, we want it to finish for our report to, um, to, uh, to work. So we'll have that. And then it, we tell it which script to run. So in this case, the script is just called generate reports using uh, PSOS, example one. Uh, and that's it, right? So um, what the way it usually works is you have your, your master script or your main script where you can do some uh, stuff at the beginning and then you run this perform script on server. You have the option to pass in parameters just as with perform script and then you can get stuff back. If the script exits with data, you can use get script result from that, uh, that, that action inside there. So all that your script that's being done on the server does is do, it does a heavy lifting uh, gathering all the information that you need, gathering the data, putting it into a variable, and then exiting that script with that variable. You then have that variable for your master script to continue on to do anything else, to either um, 
you know, uh, go to another layout that you may have uh, dedicated for reporting layout, uh, or uh, make sure that you find that, that, that there's actually information in there and so on. So it's, it's inside the master script that you have. Right? But um, all the magic happens in there. And uh, with great power becomes great, you know, comes great responsibility because if you assume that this, this script works without any testing or without, you know, without any effort to look into it, that, that, that could be a difficult assumption to have. Um, so why, why, why use it again? I, I alluded to this, to this earlier, but SQL, especially on large data sets, can take time. Layout navigation, going from one layout to another, sometimes can take time, uh, if you're on the WAN especially. A go to related record, if you're looking at record sets, that also can take time. If your report is constantly going back and forth between that, that adds up. Uh, loops could, could be uh, uh, kind of time consuming, especially if you're doing stuff inside those loops. Uh, and then nested loops as well, if you have multiple loops inside loops, that might be, um, as you're building the vertical uh, data with your loops, you can also build horizontal data with the nested loops inside there, gathering a grid of information. So uh, you know, if you have slow reports, consider potentially moving that to perform script on server. You know, I wouldn't say, every report moves there. It's, it's not going to solve every situation, but it's something to consider. Uh, in, in the server, you have a setting here uh, in the admin console uh, where you have the default is maximum simultaneous connections. It's set to 25. You can increase it. But again, you don't want to offload everything. You don't want to make your server act like uh, a, a, an application server doing all the work for everything. If you have 100 users going, going in and running perform script on server at the same time, it's going to run into issues. You know, it's just going to increase the load. Uh, it doesn't queue any requests in there. So you have, if you have this set of 25 and, and you have 26, it's going to stop and, and not allow that, that 26th connection to happen. And it'll return an error. And you know, potentially, you could lose some of the data that you have as you go in there. So there, there are a lot of caveats when it comes to the PSOS. Uh, when I first started using it, a lot of these caveats you'd learned along the way. So you assume that things are going to work exactly the same way uh, as they will with perform script. You're in the right area. You, all you're doing is having the <coughs> server do it, but that's not always the case. Right? So things, things can go wrong. Right? So there's, there's incompatible server steps, <coughs> server, uh, script steps that, that may not work on a server. <coughs> you have a bunch of errors, potentially. These are just three of them here. If the record's not found that you're looking at and you assume it's there, you know, that, that's an error. It's going to return some sort of error message. The server logs all those error messages. Sometimes the server uh, doesn't like it and, and can stop the script. If you're going to a certain layout um, or you assume that it goes to a layout and it doesn't go there, that could affect your data. And the same thing with, with, with loops. So uh, if you exit, if you have an, a go to next record, exit after last, well, that last step there, uh, when you get to the last record, FileMaker throws an error. It says, OK, that, there's no record found. So you have to deal with that. Uh, context is important. If you, uh, if you, once you have, a, if, if you have an opening script uh, and it, is, it goes somewhere, the perform script on the server is just as if you have another connection logging into that, that file. It, it doesn't know where it is. It's, 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 it, it, it's not in the same context that you are when you run that script. You have to tell it where to go if it needs to be on a specific layout. And if you don't, uh, then it's not going to run the other script. It's going to have errors along the way. Um, variables and global fields don't work the same way. So my, my, one of my original assumptions was global variable. Yeah, it works. It's there. It's throughout the whole session. But um, run it off, you know, send the script off to perform script on the server, and that, that variable is gone. So those are things that you want to either send in as parameters into the script or have some other indication that you can pull that in. Uh, and now with, with JSON, of course, we can send in a ton of stuff. But we've, we've been able to do it before. But now there's other ways that we can send in parameters um, that might be cleaner. All right. So always set error capture on um, and test for errors. And it, it's, you know, you, the debate between set error capture on at the beginning, set it on, set it off, set it on. Um, so that's not, that's not something that I'm going to, to uh, force on here. But as long as you have the error capture on so you can gather those errors and test for each of those errors as you're developing your script. You know, the, the key is test locally and make sure it's all tested locally before you offload this onto the form script on server step. Because if you don't test it locally, 
go through each of those errors, you won't know if there's errors in there. Uh, you also can have, uh, you could potentially put an error logging subscript in there or some way to log the errors uh, so that you know where those errors crop up. But if you exit after any error and then capture that data as you're debugging your script, then you'll know uh, where that happens. You can also look at the error log in FileMaker as you run this to see, well, there's a startup, error, there's a startup sequence and it can't, it's trying to open this, this new window or it's trying to uh, display this dialog uh, and, and the server side you know, server script is not going to accept that as, as a valid script step, right? So uh, those are all things that you can check in there because perform script on server is essentially a black box. I, I looked for a black black box picture, but every black box picture I could find, like the flight recorder, is it's red. So I, I'm not sure why they, they named it black box, but um, it's a black box. Once you have that script step, you send it in. You have no idea just looking at it. You cannot step through that. That's why you have to step through it locally. And if, if, if you don't debug it properly, then weird things happen, right? So, um, so right. your script will, will, not, will not like you. All right. So we'll look at some of these errors here, uh, some ways to potentially deal with these errors. If it's a loop, you have your stuff that's happen, that happens inside the loop. Uh, and before you, you, you have your go to record request page next with the exit after last in there, uh, you want to have an option to exit the loop. So for example, if get found records equals get re record number, just exit that point and then it doesn't get to that last error. It doesn't show that, that error at the end there and the server will, will, will ignore that. So this, this has saved me quite a few times and, and I, even in um, non-PSOS scripts, I almost automatically put this condition in here because if you then take that non-PSOS script and either run it as a PSOS or run it as a server side script, then you don't have that error to deal with. I don't use this very often, but because if I'm finding data, I'm testing that I'm finding the data. But in this case here, uh, and, I, and if I don't find the data, then something's wrong with my condition, so I'm going to find the data. But you have this to where you can exit the script if you run into any issues. So that um, uh, you would, would put this in probably early on because you're not gonna just exit the script and then uh, sit there and wait, why is my report not happening, right? So, but you have options to, to deal with uh, no records found because if uh, uh, no record found in FileMaker is error 401, uh, there's other potential errors in there if you don't have the, the find criteria set. But if, if a 401 error is still considered an error even though um, it's not r really an error itself. It's not going to break stuff. It, only, it might break your script. Right. So then a couple of options here in, in the startup script. If you have a startup script that, that looks at, uh, you know, opens a window or, or does something that the user needs to see, uh, bypass that because you, the server doesn't care about, about that, that part there. Just, um, just check for the pattern count being the server and do something else. So that'll bypass your startup routine. You still would need to, in your perform script on server, uh, navigate to the layout that you need to go to for your actions to take place. But this just uh, makes it easier and bypasses any, any error that you might have in there. And then check for, for the relationship in, in go to related record, uh, another four letter acronym there. Uh, so we, we like those acronyms. Um, but if, uh, if, it's, if it's valid, then the record exists and then we can go there. Otherwise, if you assume that the, re the related record exists and you start doing stuff, it's, it's going to mess up your sequence uh, and your data. Right. Any questions about, about errors? And, uh, is anyone here run into other errors with perform script on server? Anything that, that has thrown them? These are, these are the typical ones that I run into that I deal with, but I don't know if, yes? Uh, startup script. Startup script, so yeah, startup script is the, is the one at the top right there. So, um, I, I, I usually bypass it. Yeah. Is that how you, is that, is that what you've done as well? Yeah, but like if you have like logging conditions running into the startup script. Right, right. Yeah, have like an auto bypass condition. Okay, so the, so the gentleman's saying here if you have um, sort of login conditions with your startup script, um, okay. different accounts, stuff like that. So if you have uh, auto account or auto logins maybe. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, yeah, so. Um, considerations to, to keep in mind as you're, as you're, as you're doing this because uh, 
you do, if, you, if you test this locally, if you go in and say, okay, um, what's going to happen if I step into this script? What is it going to do? Um, it, now, it's not always going to match that because if I do perform script, the perform script, I'm already logged in, so it doesn't catch that part. Then you have to combine that with, uh, with say, the, the server error log uh, and also uh, a bit of head scratching, see what's going on. Uh, if you run your script and, and you expect data and it's blank, then, you know, there's something going on there. Wait, one Just moment. Wait we're going to get a mic over there. Always check for my plugins, check for connections, ESS, and so on. For, for, for connections, like ESS connections? ESS connections. That's a good point. Yeah, so any, any other connections that you have uh, on the file. Um, that's one, not one that I've run into, but uh, it, there, there's, there's lots of potential errors out there to consider. So again, uh, it's all about, about rigorous testing before uh, you actually run it. And then even when you run it, I mean, when you, if, it, if it works perfectly, uh, it still could have potential for breaking down at some point. Uh, and, and we'll see that, uh, especially with the virtual lists, right? So with the virtual lists, with return to limited data, if, um, if you gather, the way you're gathering stuff in that, that, that data set, if you have returns inside fields, you have to deal with those. If you have uh, characters that might push data to different records, different rows, then you're going to have to deal with that issue as well. So your script may run perfectly without errors. Yes? Can you just go over um, how to pass variables from the client to the server script? Because I, I tried to do that, and my workaround was to put them in a table and then access the table after the database opens on the server to run the script. But it seems like there might be a better way. Did you pass them as parameters? No. Okay, so, so we'll look at that uh, in the next demo here, that how we're gonna how pass stuff into the script and how to get stuff out of the script. So that's, we're gonna get to the real stuff here. All right, I, I think you had a question, yeah, sorry. Uh, just more of a caveat, uh, and it may be obvious, but maybe not to some people. If you're using a data separation model, be sure you do the perform script on server on the correct database, the one with your data in it, not the one you're probably running it from. That's a very good point, yes, thank you. Because yeah. the default is the one that you're in at the moment. Right, so if data separation model is you have a, a user interface file and you have a data file or multiple data files, and usually you're running the script from within your user interface file that's viewing the data, so you want to make sure that you're actually running that script in the actual data file rather than in the, the, the UI file that you're on. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one. I, actually, just a contribution. I'm right up front here. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Hi there. I can't see with the light. It's all right. Uh, one other thing, it's very similar to startup scripts, is uh, any layout script triggers you have to account for as well yes. for any of the layouts that you're going to on the server. Now, yes, that, that, that's, that's true, because you have, uh, you have your potential for, for actions on the layout. Thank you. So any script triggers that might be in, on the layout uh, could affect your, uh, your, your perform script on server if you're going in there. And that's one that you can check when you're, when you're debugging it locally. So that's one that you can rely on to make sure. Uh, the one that, uh, that with the data separation model, you can't check that locally, really, because it's, your, it's, 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 it's going to act like it's there. So, but, so it's, it's good a uh, good, good comment. Thank you. You also want to make sure in your uh, scripts, in the script workspace, that you look for compatible server script steps. You can, it's an easy drop down to check to see whether you're doing anything that you should not be doing yes. on server. Yes, so that's another good comment. So uh, one that I mentioned early on is server compatible, server compatible script steps. So if you're in your script, um, and uh, what you can do is just turn that compatibility on, we'll see that here in a second, um, to see that if any of those script steps are not compatible. Um, often you forget stuff like uh, you have commit record in there that uh, there's, you want to do it without dialogue, and there's other things in there, and it'll show that as, as grayed out or let you know that not server compatible, uh, and then you can, you can proceed to, to fix those, those actual steps there. So. Um, uh, and this here is uh, a local version. I've got um, a, a hosted version that we'll look at in a second as well. So, but the key here is to test. And I've got two slightly different uh, demos. And these demos are based on real 
uh, real reports, but they're, they're anonymized and slightly modified, so they're not showing the exact data because I don't want to pull that whole data set in there. So uh, it's the, the example is going to look a little bit, a little bit weird. Uh, all right, so let's look at the database in here. All right, can everyone see that? I have two virtual list tables in this file. One that's just default virtual list and the other one that I call virtual named. So these are for the two separate reports here. They both have 1,000 records just pre-set uh, in there. The virtual list has all the regular stuff in here with the serial, the row content for my debugging, uh, and then the columns one through 10. So those are all exactly the same way and I use a tilde separator in these, so I can just see that at a glance. Pipe separator is great, but tilde is a little bit better for debugging. Um, I have used some other separators that are, are more complex than a tilde, but uh, in all my reports so far, I've not run into an issue here, so it doesn't mean that you won't, right? Uh, then the virtual name is a little different. Instead of column one, column two, column three generic stuff, because I can push any report into that one here and, and manipulate it the way I want, this one I've named specifically. Uh, with certain headers. And although there are no spaces in here because I just kept it uh, as such, uh, you could put spaces in here. And this might be uh, for exporting with uh, headers in a certain way, uh, or just because you want to dedicate one report uh, or, or table uh, to this report and, and not have anything else go in there. So, and in this case, the get value goes on multiple global variables. So it's not just one row content global variable but you're building multiple globals in there. So it, it, it gets a little trickier when you're, when you're using something like this. So um, I'm not sure why I built it this way. I, I think I was trying something different uh, and it, it worked because it also it works for Excel how I wanted it. So, um, and then we have our sample data, right? So projects, products, pays, kits, and globals. Uh, those contain content that we'll report on. So now we're pulling in from multiple tables rather than one as an option. One report looks at projects, products, and kits, I believe. Uh, and so these, and in this case, the kits has uh, the most records in here. Uh, the reports that I base these on have uh, quite a few more records in uh, and then other stuff that it looks at, but I didn't want to just uh, fill this up with, uh, with, with that, that data there. All right. For just to keep these names uh, easy to read for the demo, they're just called demo columns master and demo columns PSOS, and then demo named master and demo named PSOS. So nothing creative there. Uh, the other scripts, when you're using in real life, could probably have some different names to identify them. In this case, they're just demo scripts. All right, so the demo master script, let me zoom out here so I can get my header. I have a perform script on server. Let me see if I can move that up. I have a, a little condition here that says, and in this case, I, I, I would, in real life, I would, when I have it on the server, I'd test to make sure that I'm actually on this server before I run this. But I'm just like making sure that I'm not accidentally running this and I'm commenting out. So uh, I belt some suspenders, I think someone says. So just make sure that I do it. If you try to run a perform script on server on a local file that's not hosted, it'll just give you an error. So um, you don't have to worry about anything happening there. It just doesn't do it. Uh, and then I have a perform script that does the exact same script that allows me to debug uh, the script before I actually turn it on to perform script on server. So once it's on the server, then all I have to do is I would just comment this out and I would uh, uncomment that or, or make it real. And then I can actually run it again. So anytime I need to debug it, if someone tells me that the report isn't working the way it should, I'll just switch those out, take the time to run it, wait through the 10 minutes or so or more as you're going through the script, see what's happening, and then uh, switch it on again if everything works. All right. So if, um, if we open this script here, We have optional script parameters that we can use. So in some reports, I'll send in 
Um, I'll need to gather, say, for example, a pay period or some other criteria, some date range, and uh, that I'm going to run and I'm going to push into the perform script on server. So I could test that with a parameter here if I needed it. And the same thing happens in uh, a perform script on server. You still have the optional script parameter in there. Once you send those parameters in, just like with any perform script, you can then do a get script parameter, or you can use custom functions if you have multiple parameters. Uh, there are multiple examples out there. Um, uh, FileMaker standards uh, has, uh, has, has some good information to have, but there's other ways to do multiple parameters. So any way that you use multiple parameters, you can send them in, you can receive them. Once they're in your perform script on server, then those parameters have now been sent. So if you have variables that you need to push in there, uh, if you have any, any field data, that's all, all done through the script parameters. Did that answer the question? Um, so just like with, with perform script, it's the same thing with, with parameters. Once you send it in, uh, then you just handle those parameters. Uh, and then you know, it, that's a good way to, it's the same thing with global, per, global variables. If you have global vari variables here, you want to send that in so it can then have that variable uh, be active inside uh, the perform script on server. Even though you don't need a global variable inside the script, if you're debugging it, it's good to see that. Um, the main thing is that when you're coming back uh, to have it here uh, to populate your table, then, then uh, that's where it comes in play. So if I have my perform script here, uh, and this here is just so I can time how long it takes for it to run. So uh, you don't need to worry about that. But the key thing is here, after my script, I set a global variable, in this case, you know, dollar sign, dollar sign row, to get script result. It gets the script result from that script that I've just performed, and it populates it into the global variable, and now I can populate my virtual list. So with my virtual list populated, then I just go to a layout, and refresh the window uh, and, and find the data that I want. So uh, we'll just save that. All right. So if I run this here locally, it's real fast local. It's a little, little slower on the server. But in this case here, uh, we're manipulating the data based on whether it's a, uh, a, a, depending on the type that it is. And then we're putting in totals. And then we might want to uh, see something that's not a kit, right? So it behaves differently. It doesn't have any breakouts here based on, uh, like it's a, the t it's, a, it's a bronze kit or a gold kit or a silver kit. Standalone kits or standalone products won't have those. So, uh, so you might not need that. Now, this is pretty basic. If I want to actually print this nicely and look at a uh, PDF, I can, I can put some conditional formatting in there. All right, so I can have, uh, have, uh, have things be gray or dark or have, have breaks between there. The condition of formatting, it's all a list view, so there's one record. So my conditional formatting set up here. So it checks the content for the, uh, in the column. And if it's certain, there's certain text in there that I put, like I put a filler or a break inside the script, then it will, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll colorize that in a certain way. All right. And then the demo, the demo name fields, so let's run that one. That does an export. And export, let's see if Excel opens up. All right, so that exports the same file here to Excel. Um, actually, it opens a different, a different table. And it puts my headers in here, so date worked, hours build, and so on, so that um, I have those headers in there. Uh, and and you, you, can do, you can set that up in the export step. But so, this, you know, in this case, in the previous one, I just needed the report visually on the layout so I could print it to PDF or something like that. So I used the generic column, column headers. Uh, here, I wanted to put it in, in as, as columns headers in Excel, so I created the, the table that way. All right. So now let's go over here. Let's see, 1,600 people on the same network. Let's see how that works. All 
All right, so this is on a, a cloud server, uh, AWS, sorry, and um, runs the exact same file. What I have here instead is, instead of having the, the, the local script, I have the perform script on server script step. So it's the same exact script. It just says perform script on server, wait for completion so that it runs, uh, and then it, it generates that data in there. We'll look at the script for that in a second. Same thing, we, I, I just have disabled this, this local script. I get the time. I set my uh, global variable with the result. And I go to my report layout, I refresh the window, uh, I find to make sure that I actually have data in there so it doesn't display all thousand records. And uh, that's, that's it. I have another uh, way to do some finds here that, that is an example uh, where you can use uh, omit multiple as another method, but uh, this one here is pretty straightforward. Just find something that's in, in the, as long as you have content in the, the row that you're, you're, you're looking at, it's going to pull that in. All right, so uh, these two scripts, these are a little bit shorter than the other one I did. They're based on them, but uh, the, the first one here, and I'm not gonna run them locally because the first one takes about 120 seconds uh, when you run it uh, locally, and the second one takes 60 seconds. So those, are, those aren't too long, but they're still painful to sit there and watch as they happen. So uh, fingers crossed, let's see what happens here. We'll, we'll run the shorter one first, so. All right, so we'll see what happens. All right, so that saved it. And it took 1.3 seconds compared to 60 seconds. I think that's still fast. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's super fast, but uh, you know, it's still fast. The other one, uh, which you know, we wanted to run that uh, right now, but it takes just over two seconds, so between two and three seconds. So again, still a lot faster once you upload the stuff on Perform Script on Server. Uh, and if you know, it's one second versus 60 second over time can save you a lot, especially if, it's, if it's, it's a critical report that you need to run every week or so. If it's something that you do, you'd sit there every time, it's, it's not worth it. I mean, it's not gonna be a big report like that. So let's see what happens in here um, with the actual PSOS. All right, so in this case, first thing that I do is establish context, right? So I wanna go to a layout. Uh, this sample file doesn't have any fancy startup stuff or anything, so uh, I, I don't really care too much about that. So I go to this layout products to make sure that that's where I am. I'm gonna show all the records, sort them in a certain way because I'm doing some sort of looping, so I want to make sure that it's sorted so I can group the records. I go to my first record, and then I build a header row, so I just have some information at the top in there. Uh, I set, initialize my subtotal variables in here so that it's just start from scratch. Uh, and then I loop through, right? So I'm not gonna go in detail on the actual looping stuff here, but the loop uh, starts here on line 34 and goes down all the way down, well, down here to uh, line 130. So it's a pretty intense loop building all this data in here. I have a bit of SQL inside here as well with uh, a join. So all this takes, you know, it's one to two seconds versus perform script and server. If you're doing this locally for each record that you're looping through, that could become painful. And I alluded earlier to the optional arguments that you have in here in the, uh, in, in the, the actual SQL. In this case, I'm running a query for each, on each record that, I am, uh, that I'm on, and I want to say, um, query this based on this record as, uh, as, the, as the product master. So instead of hard coding that, you just put the question mark in here uh, and then you put the optional argument. And if you have multiple question marks, you have multiple optional arguments, and it goes and finds those. So, uh, so this, and again, I, this is a not best practice in terms of coding SQL uh, in FileMaker because I'm hard coding the tables in here, but it's just a matter for clarity in here so we can see it really small. I've also put uh, this organized a little bit for readability so I can select down and see that, but um, this is just, this is a, just a, uh, a hypothetical demo thing that just does a little bit of stuff here. All right, so the SQL in here, there's loops. Along the way, um, I'm building this global variable. Even though it's inside the perform script on server, there's no really need to build a global variable. You can build a, just, a, just a regular variable, push it out, and then have your global. But if you're debugging it, you want to see what's in that global so that you can go to your virtual list table and see what's happening. And, and that's why I use it in here for debugging purposes as well. I'm putting in the separators as I go in here. 
Uh, and just for readability, I've split it out. You don't need to worry about that. It can all be on the same line so that you can see where it is. But it, again, this is a fairly intense script, and it's, this is even, even simplified from the previous one. Uh, but I wanted to show you know, a lot of stuff, and, I, and you may not, and some of this here that you, know, you may not, you may be able to, to, uh, to clean up if you want to optimize it, but it's, it's accrued over time. Certain things in here like filler rows, right? So if I want to use conditional formatting, I'm going to put a filler row in here, and I'll put that filler row in with, uh, with just some text at the beginning, and then tilde's on there, so it, uh, it populates in the other fields. Because if I want to put anything else into those columns, uh, I, need, I need those, those separators so I can, I can put in the appropriate column. All right. Uh, that's the columns one. The named one here uh, is very similar. This one here, uh, the difference is that I'm setting all these global variables in here rather than one global variable. So there's more stuff to manage. But uh, these, uh, this is a, a shorter loop in terms of what I'm gathering. So this one's only um, between uh, row, rows 56 and, uh, and 105. So it's, you can see that there's still times. And that's part of why the report takes less time. And this one also doesn't have the SQL query in there. It doesn't have a nested loop um, as intense. It does have uh, a loop inside there, but not as intense. Again, exit conditions in here. So exit condition one. And um, the main exit condition down here is exit if found count is, greater, is, is equal to the get record number at the end. So the loop doesn't error out on me. If I go to my uh, master and I go down here to the um, export, In this case, I have uh, this checked for Excel to use the field names as the column names in the first row. So that's why I've got this named with specific names in there. I can use spaces if I want. I had in a couple of them. I just had first name and last name without the space. But you know, you know, going in here and looking at it, it might be cleaner to have it with a space so I can do that. Uh, and, and that just makes it so I don't have to um, hard code the name into my actual uh, global variable there. All right. So to recap, perform script on server plus SQL as an option is not required. You can loop through without it. You can do other stuff to gather data, plus virtual list. Uh, let the server do the work if it's intense. Uh, you know, run it with training wheels, which means that you test it locally. Uh, and then wrap the non-perform script uh, on server script, which is your master script, around the perform script. Send in variables as needed. Retrieve any data, because you need to retrieve the data. You can't just run it and let it happen. Retrieve the data using the uh, exit script step. And then uh, once you have that, set your global variable uh, from your delimited sets. If you have SQL, that can help. If not, you just have returns in there. And then use your virtual list. You can expand the columns. So if you have 20 columns, you can add more columns. If you have you know, five columns. Uh, and you can have multiple ports that you can push into the same table uh, for different purposes, not at the same time. But. And then show only the rows that you need in that file. So there's going to be some updates to this session, uh, just to clean our data. And then, thank you. Any questions? So uh, remember to fill out your evaluations. And we have a mic over here. So if anyone needs a question. Hi. Hi. Is this on? Okay. Um, so I recently was debugging a new process that we'd implemented where a user was entering some data, then clicking on a button that would do a perform script on server and come back with the value based on a table they didn't have access to. Um, but it happened that they would have to click this button a few times for it to actually bring back the correct value. And I think what I figured out was it needed to commit the record before doing the perform script on server so that it would send back the right data before the server had access to it. But it still was a little buggy. I, was, I guess my question is, is there some kind of uh, time, some latency period between committing a record and doing a perform script on server? Or might it be a different error that I'm looking for? 
I, I'm not sure if there is a latency or not. I know that committing a record before you do that is, 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 is probably the, the, the right thing to do. Uh, but um, it depends on how that data is connected, if it needs to send it somewhere. Is this, a, is this maybe a data separation model, or there's something else that goes on? N no, it's basically, um, it, it's not a data separated model. The server is accessing one database, then cross-referencing it with another database that um, the, the usual user does not have access to to pull in basically rates based on criteria of a line item. Yeah, no, it does sound that there's, it sounds like there's latency. It's not, there's not necessarily latency between the, the perform script and server uh, uh, per se, like, like in every case, but it sounds like there is in your instance because of what's happening beforehand. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying that they're clicking multiple times, uh, is, is, is clicking once and waiting doesn't do this? Yeah, uh, it's usually two or three times before it actually brings in the correct value. So yeah. it will eventually bring in the correct value. It's just they have to click on this button a few times before it actually works, which is frustrating as a programmer to look at. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I understand. No, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I'd have, you'd have to spend a little bit more time probably debugging and seeing where where that latency is happening. Mm -hmm. If you can maybe break apart the process is, would be my suggestion. OK, thanks. Does the do double dollar sign variable persist on the server, and would another user be able to obtain that double, double dollar sign? The short answer is no. Yeah, it does not. It, the, the server doesn't recognize it if it exists in the client, and it, doesn't, it only persists in that session. Right, so a, double, a global variable is persistent in the session, and, and that, that session is, is, is only in the perform script on server. So that instance has that, that, that exactly global right. variable. Once you exit that, it's gone. So it's, the it, server doesn't have access to it from any other place. Users don't have access to it. So the only reason I use that inside the, the, the script is just so I can debug it locally. Otherwise, you, it, there's no need. You could have everything be just a, a local variable and, and do all the stuff that you need to build in the script. It really is redundant. It's only for debugging purposes. So, so that was my question from before, which was I had a, a global variable set on the client and then needed to pass the global variable to the server so that when the server script ran, it used the same variable. Right. And you had said, so can you put that global variable in the script parameter? Yes. And will it pass that global variable from the client to the server script? You have to pass it. You can't necessarily pass it in as a global variable. You just pass it in as a variable. So you take that, say, you set, you know, set something in as a name mm. in, inside, the para inside your, your optional parameter and have that value be the global variable. When you're in the script itself, you set another variable. You have to set a variable, or declare a variable right there to the content of that parameter, which is the global variable. It's no longer the same global variable. It's a different variable. But that's the only way you can get that into the perform script and server. So it will, but it, it, can, it can be a variable. You don't have to hard code text. No. It, it'll, you can put no, the variable from your client script yes, as in the, that optional script parameter. As, and as, then, right, as the value. As, as it, the, it'll accept it as a value, yeah. not yeah. as a variable. And no. then when you're in the server script, you set a variable based on that parameter that came in as a value. Yes. Okay. yes. So, you, so you could name it whatever you want as the, as the key or as the identifier. So you have to say, OK. Um, or you just put the global variable as the value itself, if that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. And then we get into the script. You say, get script parameter. And whatever the parameter is, it's going to get that value of the global. But you're setting it, again, lo locally inside the script. So you, if it's just a single parameter, you just put that global variable inside the optional parameter. If you're doing multiple stuff, you'd say, you know, uh, parameter one equals global, parameter two equals whatever text, and so on. So, so it, it takes those before it goes to the server? Yes. OK. I mean, it's, it's, just, another, it's just, a, just like the form script. It's just a parameter that you send in. Then you have to receive that parameter, and you have to declare it at the beginning or, or wherever you're, you, before you need that in the script, you have to declare it. But it's independent. It's not the same. It's not, the, it's not recognizing as a global. You have to send that in. So It's, it, it's it a new variable, it. global yes. value that exists in the yeah. session that the server created for the script, and then it goes away at the end. Yes, okay. exactly. It exists just in that perform script. OK, thank you. Sure.
Right. So if it, if it doesn't, if, if you do a find and you get the 401, then you, you, you just have to exit at that point. Or you know, you, you, if, 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 you don't need, if, you, if you need the data, then you can't proceed with the rest of it if the, there's a 401. So there's, there's always going to be a log error on the server log. Yes. Right? There's, there's, there's no way to avoid that, as far as I know. There, there might be one, but I, I yeah. yeah. Uh, I would always have error capture on. You could turn it, I mean, you, you need the error capture on so you can capture the error and so you can know what to do with it. 